Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon McKell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work, and this week I'm joined by composer Pat Irwin, whose work includes Rocco's Modern Life, Nurse Jackie, and more recently, Dexter's New Blood. Welcome to the show, Pat. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I hope you don't mind, but I do have one question. I am always interested in CBGBs <laughs> as a club. In Toronto here, we have uh, the Elma Combo, which is sort of our CBGBs. And you had a chance to like, you were there in sort of in its heyday. So what what was CBGs like, GBs like? What was playing music there like? Well, I'm going to give a shout out to Gary Top and Gary Cormier in Toronto, yeah. known as the Garys. Yeah. Who had uh, the horseshoe and oh, uh, the horseshoe! Wow. The edge. Yeah. Were some of my first New York experiences. You know, a band they would give, and I'm still in touch with Gary Top. Um, yeah but uh, back to so shout out to to gary yeah and Gary's, uh who i've known for many years i mean there was no place like cbgb's it was the first club that i went into when i passed through new york and i can remember who i saw i can remember the sound of the band i can remember the sound and i'm not talking about the band but just the way the room sounded um and it was a thrill. I mean, it had been in existence already, but and I've been reading about it. And this is this, as far as I was concerned, it was the center of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, when I moved to New York, it, it were only it's all I wanted to do. I either wanted to play CBGBs or Max's Kansas City. Yeah, and then I got to do both. Wow. Um, and so, like, when you talk about the sound reverberating, or like. The actual sound of the room. Um, can you? Because I, because I never got to experience CBGG. So, what was the sound like? What made it special? The people inside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that was part of what made it great. Is not only with a, you know, particularly the first wave of bands that uh, are still with us today. Mm-hmm. There's a handful that that aren't. Uh, the first band that I saw there was called was named Suicide, and it was it was it was phenomenal. Yeah. Um, Frankie Teardrop. Uh, there's a beautiful cover of Dream Baby Dream uh, by Suicide that Bruce Springsteen did. And it, you know, at times there were ten people in there. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like uh, always packed. You know, yeah. there were crowds. But, you know, it was not just the bands on stage. It was Hilly who ran the place. You know, the, the people who worked the door and answered the phone. It was the pinball machines up front. Yeah. You know, it was, it was electrifying because you knew, you knew that things were changing. Yeah. And it it was it was it was really really beautiful to be a part of that i'm going to interrupt this interview for one second we want to thank pixelview one of our sponsors they're a streaming solution for filmmakers pixelview lets you stream your work to remote clients for easy collaboration and it works with both on set teams and post production teams with built in video chat you can discuss and make changes in real time and stream directly from your editing software or you can use the hardware encoder to stream from DaVinci Resolve or the camera on set. See the promo code and the link in the video description below. Now, I do want to jump to uh, Dexter's New Blood. So how did you get involved with this show? I knew the show. I had worked with the showrunner, Clyde Phillips, on Mm -hmm. um, Nurse Jackie. Clyde brought me into Nurse Jackie when he took that show over. And that's really the long and short of it. I had to audition, I, but I'd also worked with the music supervisor, Michael Hill, who mm-hmm. was on Nurse Jackie as well. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it was interesting because you've worked also worked on like um, 
bored to death, which is also a great show that I feel got ended too soon. Uh, Nurse Jackie's Rocco's Life. So you've worked on some amazing stuff. Um, where, where, you know, where did you look for inspiration when you were creating the, the sound for the new Dexter show? Uh, we knew after, after a little bit of back and forth, once we started in earnest and had a, had a meeting with the, the principal, four principal producers, we we knew that we wanted a, a completely different sound than the than the original series with mm-hmm. the score by Daniel Lip. And we started to move towards talking about a more ambient, distant, cold sound. Mm-hmm. And quite frankly, I I turned to the score for Chernobyl. Uh, also the score of the social network. Those were two major uh, sources of inspiration. Oh, wow. Now, um, you know, when you're tackling something like this, um, what, like, what was the collaboration process like for you and your, your team? Because you said you'd worked together before. Yeah. Well, I... I started to put together ideas, Mm -hmm. just rough ideas, what I thought of music that I thought could belong in the show. This is even before I had a script. Mm -hmm. I just had a general idea. And I continued to do that and I would send that music, um, but I wasn't getting a lot of feedback, uh, which translates, I wasn't getting any feedback. But I knew that they were in the middle of of a very challenging production schedule and a shoot. They were chasing the weather, pandemic, COVID, whatever. It was, (laughs) they had their hands full. And I put together this rough, uh, these rough ideas for, and it wasn't until we had our first meeting that I realized that I was going off in the wrong direction. And I didn't really fully understand. So I had to pivot really quickly. Mm -hmm. This wasn't a big deal to me because first of all, when when one of the producers said he was looking for a more ambient sound, I just went right to, and they were talking about the sound design and the the ambience and the the, the vibe. Mm -hmm. I just went straight to Chernobyl. Yeah, um, the Watchmen, um, and 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 other things, and I love that kind of music anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I just I I had to work fast. Um, yeah, and then and then it was at an early meeting, and Michael C. Hall kind of opened the door to going back to parts of what I had been doing. And he was advocating for more dissonance and grit. And um, I had done these sketches with guitar feedback, Mm -hmm. just feedback and atmosphere, menacing, solitary. And um, that just, open the door. So throughout the score, I'm here in my studio, I would keep a guitar, a couple amplifiers with microphones, and I could get the sound of like several guitars, two, three at a time, feeding back through various amplifiers. Mm-hmm. And I would get that sound um, that 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 put me back into the the vibe. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because like it, you, you, if I'm not mistaken, you used some old uh, synthesizers and things like that as well. Like what, I guess what went into, what were some of the instruments that you used or how did you like to use the synthesizers to create the sound? Well, I mean, they're, they're, they're like, they're, they've got a, they've got a real personality. <laughs> One that I, I used was made actually here in my neighborhood in New York. 
uh, and there was a, 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 a synthesizer repairman who lived down the alley mm -hmm. I'm pointing towards the 59th Street Bridge right now. Yeah. And, um, and, and he, he, he recognized it, the synthesizer. Oh, no way. Um, and it, it's not a well-known, um, it's called the cat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it basically generates noise. You know, and yeah, and I had to be careful with it. Uh, I used it in, in the beginning on a couple of cues, and it just was it was too it didn't sit into the track well, and it bumped a couple of the editors. And so I had to pull it back, and I still used it, but in a different way. And I used a mini moog um, to create some very low loops. Mm -hmm. And then I used some more uh, traditional uh, plugins that are available mm -hmm. to everyone. So when you get like the script, you know, <clears throat> are you, are you putting in like emotional beats or emotional moments that you want to create, you know, sort of specific sounds for or specific uh, moods? Cause you're saying you're talking about it being very uh, moody or tone based. Uh, so when you're, looking at the script, like, are you making notes on that or do you wait for the whole film to come in or the whole uh, episode to come in? Um, I'm looking at the stack of the scripts over there. I've done that. I have taken mm -hmm. notes in Nurse Jackie and, and, and Bored to Death and other things, but, I, and I, but I'm not so sure I, I did that in, in um, Dexter, New Blood. I think I was, I was, really focusing on the different characters and the storyline. Um, mm -hmm. And when I started to get, it wasn't until I got the cut, the first cut, rough cut, that I felt like I was, I was in the room with everyone. Yeah. And, um, and there are some emotional beats, but I didn't really, I didn't really plug into that until I saw the rough cut mm -hmm. on, in the case of this one. Interesting. Now you talked about sort of, uh, I guess, tuning into the the story when you you see it. <clears throat> How do you like to use uh, music as a storytelling tool in, when you're creating it for a show or a movie? It needs to be a part of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, it, it it's more than that. You know, it 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 gives you a sense of place and a sense of time. Certainly, the pace. Yeah, it can speed you up, speed it up, slow you down. It can push you away. It can pull you in. Mm -hmm. um, all those things. Oh, that's interesting. We, 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 or maybe we. I, I was going to say I, but I think we we knew that we wanted the score to be a little of both. I mean, push, mm -hmm. push away. We didn't want to get too close to the sky. But then we started to want to get pulled into his story with, particularly with, mm. with his son, Harrison. Now, was there a particular uh, scene or moment that you found difficult to compose with, but you're really happy with the outcome? Oh, uh, I, if you hadn't put it the second part, I would have been able to answer, <laughs> answer that. We can right remove away. the second part. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, right early, right early on, when 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 Dexter's getting his in first victim, and he and he's back, and he's creating this. They call it a kill room, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's exacting his revenge, if you will, on his first victim of the season. I struggled with that. Uh -huh. uh, that moment, that sort of triumphant. Uh, I didn't have, I just didn't have a real handle on it. Yeah. And and it was in, and I'll tell you a funny, funny little story. I, I I didn't really hide that I struggled with it. I had to redo it a couple of times and I don't think it, it was me at my best, but I think it was effective. And um, one of the producers says, you just wait at the screening. People are gonna go nuts at this at this part. Yeah. I was sitting next at the screening filled with fans and I had no idea, you know, it was so the involvement of the fans 
and how much the music was a part of it for them. It was mm-hmm. way cool. And I'm sitting next to Michael Hill and it's this moment. And sure enough, people erupted. It cheered and Michael just, you know, <laughs> he smacked me in the ribs and he's go, see, um, I struggled with that. There was a speech that Kurt Caldwell gave. Yeah. Um, it was kind of a takeoff on, oh God, what's the movie that they're referring to? Uh, the the Christmas the famous Christmas movie was uh, it's a wonderful life. Yeah. Um, I struggled with that one, but I'm really happy with they with the with that with the way that one turned out. Oh, interesting. Now <clears throat> you've had a um, a very long and varied career. You've done all these amazing different things. What's what? what excites you uh, about music still, right? Because some people, when I talk to them, they've been working for years and they're sort of, you know, they're burned out or they're tired, but what still excites you when you're working on projects? I, oh man, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I, come on, this is, this is, this is the real deal. I, I, I love, you know, the best part of it is at the end of the day is the hang. Mm-hmm. you know the people that you're working with that's really what you're left with and you know working with getting you know getting into it and being a part of the filmmaking or the tv making mm-hmm. working with clyde scott michael c hall marcos michael hill the music editor the editors uh you know, it's it can be really solitary. Mm-hmm. It and the deadlines aren't fair, particularly. But if you can't handle it, you know, get you know, you're not you're not there. I I love just being a part of it. Yeah, that's I, I like what I like about composing for film or TV is that it gives me a chance to explore something new. Mm -hmm. I've been lucky about being in some bands. I've also played concert music more and more. But the thing about doing a soundtrack is like, it's like an open book, you know, you get, all right, I'm ready to go. What is on the next page? Yeah. And I just, it's, it's, or, you know, you mentioned, you know, it's give me the ball. Yeah. I want to play. <laughs> yeah. Now I have uh, one last question for you. What would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or TV show to watch? I'm going to have to pick some cartoon maybe. Okay. I've been actually thinking about, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just rattle them off. Bojack Horseman. Oh, that's a great show. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I was, I was thinking about, uh, Beavis and Butthead. Yeah. Um, the new the new series or the original? Well, it was the original. <laughs> it was a line, it was a line in there that I won't go into right now, but I yeah. it made me laugh out loud like I was thinking about it. The, the chef uh just cracked me up. And uh, you know, I I really, you know, so that maybe that's a guilty pleasure. Yeah. Oh, that's a fantastic one. <laughs> Were you now? I remember Beavis and Butthead coming out around the same time as Ren and Stimpy. Did you also watch uh, Ren and Stimpy? Oh, please. <laughs> I mean, Ren and Stimpy was mind blowing. Yeah. Those was, that first season or what it was it the first seven episodes first yeah. season as good as it gets. Yeah, such yeah. a weird but such a specific sense of humor. So great. Oh my goodness! You know yeah. that that's that's as good as it gets. Now, did you, and now this one would probably be, did you ever watch Eek the Cat? Because it was made for kids, but I felt like it was very much, it was like almost like a stepping, you know, stepping stone into Ren and Stimpy and its weirdness. I don't know. No, um, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar yeah. with that. Yeah. Okay. Because that played up here. I didn't know where it would play in the States, but well, thank you so much for letting me interview today. Oh yeah. It's fun. Well, that's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com. Or of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Raquel. Thanks for watching.
Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.